Today we have a presentation by Trevor Rourke. He is the program manager for UW-Stevens Point Adventure Tours and has held this role for the last eight years. Even though Adventure Tours have been running tours for adults since 1983. He's an alum of UWSP and a year-round bicyclist. I can't imagine bicycling a couple days ago in the rain, but maybe. Trevor also volunteers as a bicycle advocate in Stevens Point and chairs the city's Bicycle and Pedestrian Street Safety Commission to bring about transportation equi equity. He also sits on the Parking Advisory Board for UW Stevens Point in Stevens Point and loves talking with people about parking issues at the university and at the city level. But don't approach, <laughs> approach him to appeal your parking tickets, especially on our campus. He also has a wonderful supportive wife and two loud and adventurous kids that still barely fit into his burly bike trailer at ages three and six. Friends and guests, let's please welcome Trevor Rourke. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, Julie. How's everyone doing today? Great. You been having a good time at the Good Ideas Conference here? Yes. What a schedule. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining us today. Talk about UWSP Adventure Tours. I just want to dive right into what we do and then go from there. And really, Adventure Tours, we've been at it again since 1983 for a long time, but not as many people know about it in Wausau. How many people have heard of Adventure Tours before? I know I've presented to some people in this group already and recognize some of you, which is great. Uh, but I'm the program manager and tour leader for specific tours, as well as Amy Belk, who is our uh, uh, communications specialist, and she's also a tour leader. But we also have a team that includes 20 more tour leaders for Adventure Tours, and they lead different types of adventures all over the world. Um, Really, Adventure Tours is kind of this unique thing, and what we do is different than a travel agency. Some people just say, aren't you a travel agency for the university? And I say, no, not quite. We're quite a bit different. Um, we have faculty and staff, as well as retired faculty and staff, and alumni that have special interest or expertise or a lot of history in a certain area of the world, and they bring people there and they share that experience, they share their expertise. Sometimes they're trilingual, um, and it's just an, an exciting adventure. We also focus on the seven dimensions of wellness. Has anyone heard of the seven dimensions before? Oh, we got one person. <laughs> Next time I'll get two. Seven dimensions, a uh, good way to remember it is species uh, for an acronym. Uh, that's um, social, physical, Edu no, oh, close. Environmental, C is career, I is intellectual, E is emotional, and then S is spiritual. So it's kind of an interesting mix, but we focus on every single dimension every time we build a tour. Um, so it's kind of a unique program within Stevens Points University. So I've been to New Zealand. I've been to Fiji, I've been to Costa Rica, I've been to the Grand Canyon several times, I've been to different states around the US, I lived in Alaska for a summer, so I've been to different places uh, as well as Europe a little bit. How many people have traveled internationally? Oh, <laughs> that's probably why you're here actually. <laughs> yes, yes, very cool. How many, how many, where have we been? Maybe a volunteer, how many people have been to Europe? That's pretty common. Anyone been to New Zealand? Oh, look at that. Awesome. I know there's one specific lady back there. <laughs> she traveled with me last time. Two times ago, actually. Has anyone been to the Grand Canyon? Wow, that's amazing. Has anyone hiked rim to rim? <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a little more challenging. We'll talk more about that. Has anyone been to the Netherlands? Ooh, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Awesome. We're going to dive in a little bit more. See what happens. Can anyone demonstrate the haka for me? Oh, <laughs> come on up. <laughs> okay. 
So the haka is this ceremonial dance. Some of you may have seen it on YouTube or if you watch rugby on a regular basis. You know the All Blacks from New Zealand, very famous uh, football group, as they would call it. Um, and it's a ceremonial dance that has origins beyond our knowledge. It's really interesting. So the focus of the dance is ceremonial, but it, it kind of introduces a challenge to the visitor. Introduces a challenge or it might be in accordance with a ceremony like a wedding or some other celebration. Um, there's a lot of critics nowadays that would say the haka dance has been kind of culturally appropriated, appropriated. And so there's more of a modern style to the haka. Um, do we have a volunteer? You laughed, but I am looking for a volunteer. One person, come on up. Come on. No? Yes? No. <laughs> Don't worry, you won't have to dance the haka. You won't have to dance. All right, come on up. <laughs> awesome. Oh, cool. Okay, we're going to go up on stage real quick. Just need a volunteer, no big deal. All right, I'm going to give you the chief stick over here. Yep, here's your chief stick. This is just a trekking pole, don't worry. It's kind of blunt in the tip with tape, so you can't hurt me. That is your weapon, let's say, okay? Um, did you hear that? Hold on a second. Okay, back to seriousness. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, why well, get serious, right? Well, um, what would normally happen in that type of ceremonial dance? I'm lost. Where are we going? What would normally happen is someone would offer that visitor some gift, usually a fern leaf. I don't have a fern leaf with me from New Zealand. I'm sorry about that. But they would usually offer a gift. And depending on how the visitor accepts the gift is how the rest of the story will go. If they don't accept it wisely, it is most likely they will die. If they accept it graciously, then the tribe will typically welcome the visitor into their village. So again, that was the haka. Here's a much better version. Yeah! 
That does go on for another minute or so, but we will move to another version. This is a more modern haka. And now the All Blacks just waiting for the French to peel off the tracksuits, stand in front of them, and receive the challenge of the haka. We'll go on probably for another three minutes, but we'll move on to some other context you probably haven't seen before. You don't see that at your typical wedding ceremony <laughs> or reception, do you? What happens in the end is the is is the the bride. She was so surprised, she ends up just breaking down and crying. Uh, she was very grateful for that. This is me in New Zealand. I think Cassie, you were with me when this happened. Is that right? I think so. So I was selected as the chief of our tribe, and I think I did accept the offering in a good light. Even though this is a very threatening posture by the, uh, the Maori person who tried to show that demonstration. So this is all part of our New Zealand adventures and we're continuing on uh, actually for next year my last tour of leading a New Zealand adventure is the active New Zealand adventure and we're focusing not only on the culture, the foods, the amazing landscapes, but also adventurous activities. This is a, a beautiful photo of Queenstown, New Zealand. This is right outside the city center. This is probably my favorite place on the planet, and I love showing this photo of a nice park bench. <laughs> we do uh, all kinds of cool things like kayaking the Abel Tasman. Depending on weather, this is an uh, open ocean in a nice, beautiful bay area of the south island on the northern part, and uh, plenty of kayak rentals, we, we end up uh, exploring the coast, it's beautiful. For this next tour, we're actually going to be going to Fox and Franz Joseph Glaciers, uh, doing a little hiking there as well to see how the glaciers are, how much they've receded, um, the flow, and just the beauty of that area. It's actually considered more of a, a wetland in the southern uh, West Coast. Here's a, here's, a, here's a photo that's actually on my uh, desktop of my computer. <laughs> this is a photo I took. My feet are right there. And we were uh, doing this thing called canyoning in New Zealand. This is the last time I went in 2017. And canyoning is a combination of rappelling and jumping into pools and zip lining and doing all this really cool stuff along cascading waterfalls. It's a pretty amazing uh, component to our tour. Uh, the, the gentleman on the left, you can kind of see him hooked up to the cable right there, just like the, the other people are hooked up as well for safety. I told him, hey, I got this really awesome view, and he threw me his camera. It's 
waterproof camera. He's like, here, take a picture. So I did. Here we go. My feet. That was in Sleeping God Canyon, uh, the Coromandel Peninsula in New Zealand. So the northern, sorry, the North Island of New Zealand. This was the whole group for, for that specific day-long adventure. The guy on the left, you can sort of see he's got a thumbs up and a thumbs down. So he's not really sure of this adventure yet. This is the beginning. He's actually very much afraid of heights. Ooh, I know, right? Why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> but he did. That was the amazing thing. He was scared, but we empowered him. We knew that these guides were phenomenal. They have a huge reputation of providing safety and humor and delight and very much a lot of care of that Sleeping God Canyon. They actually have an agreement with the local Maori tribes to make sure there's the only tour operator is this tour operator, and they take really good care of the canyon. So Quaid was a, a great adventurer that day. I was also impressed by this gentleman, Tony. Yeah, I think he lives in Wausau still. Um, but I think he was probably around 60 or so years old. And he did it as well. He was empowered, and he just said, you know what? I'm never going to have a chance to do this again in my life. Let's just do it. And he laughed so much. Another great adventure we do was the Tongariro Alpine Crossing. And it's kind of a, uh, just an amazing feat, even though it's a day hike and usually takes only five to eight hours for an individual hiker to, to conquer. Um, that uh, background you see would be considered Mount Doom. If you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings uh, books or the, the movie itself, um, Peter Jackson actually featured Mount Doom, that uh, active volcano right there. And you'll see cool th things like this um, at the airport even, just when you arrive in New Zealand. So we do actually go to different places that are part of the Lord of the Ring trilogy <laughs> and Hobbit series. So it just really depends on who's on our tour and if we want to highlight those for the group. And this is called Hobbiton, if you're not familiar. So I've been there in 2014, 2017. I was actually first there in 2004 when I discovered New Zealand, discovered New Zealand myself, <laughs> not the first person. When I discovered this New Zealand for myself is right after college, and uh, I love the country so much I just had to go back. And thankfully I have this position at the university, I could do that. So we are actually going next winter, and there's a little highlight video if it works. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Oh, here it goes. So some, some takes, some, some video of what the adventure might look like. So that's just kind of a highlight of, of New Zealand and some of our adventures there. Another tour that I lead is the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim. So I, I didn't see any hands go up regarding hiking Rim to Rim, but a lot of people went to the Grand Canyon, it sounds like. Is that right? Let's see those hands again. Grand Canyon. Did you mostly just go to the South Rim? Hike the Rim Trail a little bit, maybe take the bus back and forth. You did go down a little bit. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we take it to the next level. We go Rim to Rim. It's a, but we don't do it at the, how would you say, the athlete's pace, right? Some people are crazy enough to go rim to rim to rim in one single day. Yep, and the world record is just over five hours for that. <laughs> it's just, which is crazy. You're basically jogging the whole thing, 
And if anyone's been there and you've seen or even navigated some of the, the trail, if you're jogging and you hit a stone the wrong way, see ya. You don't want to do that. So we actually take our, our time. We take our, a good pace. We hike two days rim to rim. We stay at the Phantom Ranch in the bottom of the canyon, one of the big highlights of the tour. So just a, a few factoids. There's over, four, over 5 million people that visit the Grand Canyon every single year. I think there was a huge year of 6-plus million. Uh, might have been their 100-year their anniversary. I can't recall which year it was. But, um, and only less than 1% actually hike rim to rim. So it's a very small percentage of people that actually visit the Grand Canyon. Plus, you got those amazing layers of rock. I mean, obviously that's the huge highlight of all the cutting, the Colorado and its various connections, various um, groundwater systems have played over the millions of years. It's just a phenomenal sight, as, as most of you know that have been there. For us, we do a bit of training because if you try uh, this type of challenge on your own or with a group, you'll know or you'll discover very quickly it does take training no matter who you are. I train myself. I specifically train so that if someone else gets injured, I have that extra physical mass and stamina as well as cardio to get them out of the canyon as well. So I do a little bit extra training beyond what I normally would do. But for the regular hiker, we actually suggest a certain uh, uh, training protocol. And, you know, obviously everybody's different, and we always recommend talking with a doctor. Um, and then proper planning is so key, too, especially with the gear that you have or that you rent or you borrow. Uh, things like trekking poles, I will never hike the Grand Canyon without. So we actually have that uh, fitness screening that we use for people that do want to hike with us. And it really is critical to make sure that everyone's going to be healthy enough and fit enough to hike the Grand Canyon rim to rim. Um, but we do, at the same time, want to empower people to take on this challenge. Um, the, uh, I was just absolutely surprised. I had a gentleman hike with me last time around. He was 73. And uh, it was his birthday that weekend. And I just couldn't... I couldn't believe it, how amazingly fit he was, and he didn't complain at all. Whereas I had younger folk that were just like, uh, you know, a little bit of struggling, right? Do they not take it seriously? It's possible. But this gentleman I was very impressed with. The cool thing is, too, is we hike with a group. We don't just do one-on-one -on -one or a few people. We usually have six to eight people along with two tour leaders every time we go. There's a lot of bonding that goes on, a lot of cool things like singing songs and, and uh, learning uh, about ex other people's experience, travel experiences, life stories. Uh, so it's really cool. You'll make a lot of friends on this tour. There's a lot of different perspectives I experience when I hike the Grand Canyon each time, and I know people that visit it have the same type of experience. It really is transcending sometimes. Of course, we provide the direction, and you provide the reflection. <laughs> There are some fun uh, signs at the Grand Canyon, uh, like this one on the right, what goes down must go back up. So true. Um, I've had experiences where I did not understand what the person was doing, hiking down as far as they were with a big gulp soda in their hand. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to keep my eye on this hiker just in case. And I later discovered she had a chocolate bar and I'm thinking, it's 90 degrees out in the bottom of the canyon, and you've got a chocolate bar. I'm thinking, okay, yes, you can do that, but <laughs> that's not the best. Replenishing electrolytes is really key for hiking the Grand Canyon. Sometimes people think this is a passion. Hiking is a passion, or challenging your body is a passion, or a hobby. Um, for me, it is kind of aspirational. It really is, um, especially when I can see other people meeting the challenge. That's just probably my favorite part. And, you know, feeling connected to the canyon itself happens every single time, as well as the friends you make along the way. We do support each other along, along the tour, which is a lot of fun. And if someone's lagging behind, we're always there to pick up the slack and help out. 
Now here's a quick video about uh, some of our previous experiences in the canyon. Let's see if it works. So that's our hiking the Grand Canyon rim to rim adventure. Another tour I'm actually leading is a brand new one. It's called Bike Like the Dutch. And uh, totally different, totally unique, different sort of adventure. And it's going to focus on urban cycling the most. So a lot of people, when they think of a cycling tour or a bicycle tour, they think of traveling from country to country or along some sort of a, uh, a large or long river, like the Danube or something. This is quite a bit different. This is going to focus on smaller trips, the infrastructure itself, the culture that you experience, and the places you see. Let me go further. So when people see pictures like this or videos or even go there, they think bicycle culture. They say this in the United States especially. What is this bicycle culture? Well, if you ask a Dutch person, I am so, or you suggest, I am so excited about your bike culture. They'll be like, what are you talking about? What bike, what do you, what do you mean? And then they might start processing their mind, they might start saying, is this some sort of subculture I'm not understanding you talk to me about? I mean, I know you're American and all, but what is this subculture? Is this like a, a small group of musicians that love the Beatles? I, I don't know, for them, Bicycling is normal life. That's why it's not really a cultural phenomenon. It's just normal. So getting a to, from A to B is just normal if you hop on a bicycle, if you use your feet walking, jump on a tram, jump on a train, or even drive a car. So it's a Feetzer country. Feetzer stands for bicycle. And um, the reason they are this way, I'll just mention a few. There are a lot more. I'm going to touch upon a few. Um, 18 million people roughly, and there's 22.5 million bikes in the country. So more bikes than people. 4.5 billion bicycle trips per year. 6 to 8 billion in the U.S. is what we come up with. But our population is 327 million. So about 10 times less. We actually bike about 10 times less than they do. Average Dutch woman, man, and child pedals 1,000 kilometers, or about 620 miles per year. So it's not that much, if you think about it. So it's two miles, you know, that's over two miles per day. Is that right? So that's not that much, really, right, per day. But if you're getting from A to B, anywhere you go, that's just normal life. Yet the Dutch don't cycle because it is flat, if that, was a, if that was a case, Chicago or Winnipeg would be the, cap, the bicyclist capitals of North America. If flatness was the only attribute that was necessary. The weather is awesome or nice. If anyone has witnessed a storm off the North Sea, not so nice. Uh, are they morally superior than us? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at local politics or federal politics, I, well, it's debatable. We'll just say it's debatable. They actually bicycle because they built it, right? They built 35,000 kilometers of fully separated bicycle infrastructure. That's like 22,000 miles of fully separated. And if you're not familiar with fully separated, that means the bike lane, which what we would consider a bike lane, has some sort of a barrier, not just paint, 
between you and the motor vehicles to the left of you. Whether they're bollards or planters or trees or cars parked, there's a physical separation. They also tame the motor vehicle with over 75% of urban streets um, traffic calmed to a speed of about 19 miles per hour or less, 19 or less. For them, it's uh, 30, 30K or less. And they also spend through governance about 30 euros or 35 US dollars per person per year on bicycle infrastructure. That's a lot of money. So I have Stevens Point up there because that's where I live. That would be about $910,000 for Stevens Point. <laughs> that's a lot of money per year. That's amazing. The return on investment. So a lot of people, when I talk about bicycling as an advocate locally, a lot of people say, well, show me the numbers or what is the return on investment if you spend money on bicycling? They can show you this. Just, I'm going to share one, and that's the fatality rate. So they have 3.4 annual deaths per 100,000 residents. We have 10.6. And this is per 100,000, so it's basically a per capita number. It's not based on land mass. It's not based on um, how many cars you have, how many bikes you have. It's based on people. So this would save, if we had a rate like this in, US, in the USA, this would save 20,000 people's lives every single year, every single year. Because we're up, uh, we're around 36 or 37,000 per year, somewhere in there, right now. The funny thing is, and uh, I didn't know this fully until I went there and started researching it, but it wasn't always this way. They were doing the same thing we were. This is uh, 1978. Uh, in Amsterdam, this street called Erste van der Helstraat. And uh, this is how it looked in 1978. Uh, cars were taking over as the major form of transportation in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. And then here's what it looks like today. Through the 1973 oil embargo, tons and tons of protests from a grassroots uprising, as well as government support and defeat on certain platforms, the people decided they wanted bikes over cars. Really interesting story. That is the shortest version of that story you'll ever hear. But there's also really cool infrastructure they're building today that enables regular people to ride a bike. So that goes on longer, but you can get the point. That's a pretty amazing piece of infrastructure right there, and not cheap, right? The prioritization is quite a bit different. Oh no, it's cut off a little bit, but that's okay. I'll speak to it. So let's look at the bicycle itself. The bicycle isn't that much different than it used to be in the 1800s. That's amazing, because when we think about bicycling, we have this stigma in the US, and this is kind of where we get it wrong sometimes. We have the stigma about, okay, I gotta get this gear, I gotta get that gear, I gotta have a helmet, I gotta have this type of brand of bicycle, I gotta have these studded tires, I gotta have X, Y, Z, and even more. I gotta have Lycra, I gotta have this. How does that enable the eight-year-old child to ride a bike? How does that enable someone who's maybe 85 and they're learning to ride a bicycle for the first time? Doesn't work. So there's a stigma in the US and obviously it's been encouraged a lot by the different brands, right? There's a lot of brands of bicycles. But in the Netherlands, they do it differently. They think of it as this more practical machine. They kept it the same. You have this um, cutout, right? So the bar, the top bar, usually in the United States, either it's straight across from handlebars to seat post, you know, where if you fall off, it's really gonna hurt, or what they would call a, I guess, a woman's or a lady's bicycle where it cuts right down, sort of like that. 
In Amsterdam or Netherlands, it's like that for every bike, almost. Almost every single bike. It doesn't matter what gender you are. They would probably think that's silly. Because it makes sense. You step through it. It's very easy. We rented bikes there when I was there, and we just stepped through. And it was, it was like a breeze to get on a bike. Um, this is called the Oma Fiat, or Grandma Bike. And again, you see kids riding these bikes. You see teenagers. You see people in their 20s, 30s, 40s. It doesn't matter. They're riding these bikes just to go from A to B. They have all these things called accessories, or what we would call accessories, like a bike light, fenders, uh, chain guard, extra lock, the bike uh, rack on the back for panniers, all this stuff. We call them accessories. They call them standard. It comes with the bike every time. But we have to buy them separately. It's a really interesting scenario. So it's unattractive as well. That's part of it. It's sort of unattractive. So nobody's going to steal it. Actually, I do that to my bike. I don't clean it up that much. I know I should probably lubricate the chain more during the winter. I, I definitely need to do that. But it's slightly rusty on the fenders and maybe a couple other spots. But guess what? Nobody's going to steal it. I got that going for me, at least. So they find it to be a very practical thing. Is this part of their culture? <laughs> this is really normal life. They'll find bikes for hauling anything, really. I mean, that's five kids right there. That's impressive. Here are some video clips of myself and my wife scouting out uh, Amsterdam and other parts of the Netherlands for this tour. Kind of see some cool things we were doing. There's a bicycle parking garage down there. So that was a little bit about the Bike Like the Dutch tour. Again, we're bringing people from the United States over to the Netherlands to experience, to witness what it's like to bicycle in what some people call bike heaven. So hopefully I've been able to share a taste of UWSP Adventure Tours with you today, and I'd love to open it up for any questions or discussion. Yes? This one, yeah, this is coming up uh, June of 2020. So we got a bit of time yet. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, will you be, for the people who want to sign up for something like that? Perfect segue. <laughs> I'm actually, yeah, I'm passing around. Yeah, great, great question. I'm passing around a clipboard right now. If you're interested in learning more information about any of the tours I highlighted today, um, it's also a sign up for our newsletter and you get $20 off every single tour that we run. We're also giving away a water bottle and a t-shirt just by signing up on that list as well today. But yeah, for that question specifically, any tour you sign up with us, we work with you if, if it's a more strenuous or challenging tour like the Grand Canyon, 
Right, or if it's this one, the, the bike like the Dutch, we actually have what's called a traveler orientation. And the tour leader, which would be myself for this specific tour, and if we get a large group, there, I would have a co-leader, we would work through and talk to you about any specific challenges, physical, mental, etc. For this tour, it's gonna be a lower key and more relaxing pace. So I'm thinking it's probably gonna be anywhere from five to maybe 10 miles per day at the most. So most cycling tours, I, I see people, hmm, oh. <laughs> most cycling tours are you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles per day because um, they're going from A to long, far away B, right? Our intentions are really to experience the local network of bicycle infrastructure, to experience the places that are there, to share in the culture. Um, so it's more than just how far can you get, how fast can you go? So great question. Any other questions? Yes? How many people would you take on a tour like this? So this specific tour for myself, I would take a, probably up to 12 people at the most. And then if I need a co-leader, if there's a lot of demand and a lot of people want to go, probably be around 18. And then I have a co-leader with me. The largest tour we run right now is, New Z uh, excuse me, is Iceland. That's about 20 people. The smallest tour is hiking the Grand Canyon, and that is a maximum of eight. So eight to two tour leaders. And that's a very specific one because that is a life-threatening type of situation depending on the weather, water availability, and other conditions, as well as fitness level. So we take that one very seriously. Good question. Any other questions? Oh, where are we going this year? Great question. Um, see, remaining, we have a, um, a tour that's actually full right now, an Austria cycling tour. That, that is one of those long distance cycling tours along the Danube. Uh, that's a bike and boat tour. But that one's full, unfortunately, that's in May. We're also going to two different Iceland tours. Uh, there's a women's Iceland tour, as well as a West Fjords tour for any gender. And those are both led by Sue Kissinger, as well as her husband, Don, for the, the West Fjords. We also have a Boundary Waters Canoe Area Tour. Um, it's a canoeing and camping. Um, the most challenging thing there, obviously, is paddling, as well as camping uh, in, the, in the wilderness. So, um, and then we're also doing a Sorrento Amalfi Coast Tour. That's uh, mostly focused on hiking in the Sorrento and Amalfi areas of Italy, uh, led by Jutta Brendel and Richard Ruppel. Uh, they've been there, I think, at least a dozen times. And Jutta, she is fluent in Italian, German, and English. And Richard's fluent in German, English, and a little bit of French, I think. And I think that's it for the rest of our year. Yes? Sure. Question was about logistics. Yeah, we set up all the hotels. We basically arranged the entire tour package. And then you essentially... Uh, join us as a group. Um, when it comes to flights, we always separate flights out of the tour package because people connect with us from all over the country. Um, I had people from Boston, people from Portland, people from Texas, Arizona, Illinois. There's people from all over the United States that keep, the, keep joining our tours. And so we decided there's no way you can find an average flight price for that. So we basically said, we'll just leave that out. Plus, people like to use their miles. Um, so if you want to use your own carrier that you prefer, whether it's you know, United, Delta, or you know, Lufthansa, or whatever it is, you can end up using your miles better. So great question, yeah. So the lodging, the meals, the activities, we'll all set those up. Sometimes we do build in some free time as well, and then say, here, you know, here have the rest of the afternoon off. And here are activities X, Y, and Z we highly recommend doing, um, but it's up to you if you'd like to do them. Did you have a question too? Well, yeah. I just have a question. Um, do you um, tend to, you have to have some countries where you have people, the tour guides have to speak that language, right? That's right, yeah. Absolutely. A great example is Costa Rica, which is on tour right now. Uh, we work with Lloyd Martinez. He's part of a tour operator in-country. Uh, Viajes Colibri, 
and he's very fluent in English and Spanish. Yeah, so depending on the country, uh, for me, I'm very lucky and fortunate. Netherlands, English is their second language, very bilingual there or trilingual. Um, so it's a really easy country to uh, immerse into. Fresh English speakers. <laughs> Good question. Anybody else? Okay, well, I'll stick around for a little bit. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you.